So here we are. We are a full week into the federal election campaign here in Canada. And uh, over the past week, John Wright from uh, Maru Public Opinion and I have uh, spent some time sort of framing, you know, on a daily basis, what's going on on the campaign trail and, and how Canadians are reacting or whether they're paying attention at all, quite frankly. It's so early and considering we're still in the dog days of summer in August. Not surprising that most people are not heavily engaged. and uh, But I think we struggle with some of the things around the ballot question, for example. How likely is it that people are even going to go to the polls, considering our attitudes? So this week, it uh, was interesting to see uh, the letter from the editor uh, at The Logic, David Scott, posting his uh, weekly offering, and in some respects, turning the lens around on us where we're so focused, particularly in media, about who's going to win, who's going to lose. We look at polls as, in terms of a horse race, and we, we always talk of elections in terms of winning and losing. But I thought David nailed it this week when he turned it around and said, you know, for the most part, what we get out of an election is really a reflection of what we are uh, as a country. David joins us now. It's good of you to be here. Thanks. Oh, great, Dave. Always great to chat with you. So, you know, the work that you guys do at The Logic um, for me has always been, and I, I frame it in the second or third thing that comes to mind. And I think your your blog this week really sort of nails it. Just, you know, I often tell people, you know, you kind of get the government you deserve. And they look at me and say, well, what does that mean? Well, to the degree to which you are paying attention, the degree to which you are motivated to stand up and hold others accountable for what they do politically or otherwise is the government that you're going to get. It's the country that you're going to live in. And so I think you, you kind of pulled that thread for me this week. And, uh, you know, I don't think a lot of people think of it in those terms. We, you know, we think of the election as once every two to four years, depending on the majority or minority government, and then we push it aside and let it happen. Yeah, it is, it is. you know, as a journalist, as an editor, and Dave, you, you know, I know you you as well know this, our job is really uh, to always be a mirror or reflection back on the society that we're covering or serving. And so when you look at an election and you look at the inner machinations of an election and the, you know, the opposition wars that go on and the nitty gritty, it's easy for the campaign media coverage or reporters to chase that daily story and to go after who said what on this day and how that's playing into the strategy or the game of the election, just like it would if you were thinking about the Blue Jays and, you know, what pitching change they're going to make. It's not that different. And I think uh, we as media have um, often we fall into that trap. And and so as, as you kindly point out in my column, I, I think what I was trying to say was, Look, if we step back from this and you look at it through its entirety of the next five weeks, this campaign, what the issues are that are discussed and that are highlighted and surfaced in this campaign will say more about us as an electorate and what we demand of our leaders than it does about the leaders themselves. And so, you know, we can get into some of those issues, of course, but I think it's an important thing for us to put that expectation and place that expectation on the political journalists covering the campaign to say, wait a minute. You know, maybe I care about a social media post this week or an opposition dump that's trying to get a leader trapped one way or the other. But really, you know, this is about the future of a country at inarguably one of the most trying and significant moments in the history of the country. And we need to be having that conversation. And this needs to be a conversation about what is the future direction of this country. And it's important to frame it that way, because what we saw in that first week of the campaign is a prime minister who, you know, decided it's time to go to the polls because his answer to all of this as to why are we calling an election was to look in the rearview mirror because of how he behaved during the COVID pandemic. Here's what you got. You're going to get more of that. If you like what you saw, then, then vote for it. On the other hand, we've seen the other parties to some degree address that, but for the most part, Look forward. How are we going to stand this economy back up? How are we going to make sure that it's safe for our kids to go back to school? How are we going to deal with housing? How we, you know, so those affordability issues, I think, came to the fore. And what I thought was interesting is that, for the most part, 
uh, even what you saw in Nova Scotia this week. That rear view mirror look isn't playing well and not engaging. And that, in fact, Canadians, I think, are maybe even ahead of you and I on this, David. They're already saying these are the issues that we want to pursue. We want some vision on. Uh, so even, you know, media catching up to the what the uh, general you know, population in Canada wants in terms of, of its uh, of its leadership. I just think that we get lazy in the media. <laughs> I mean, you didn't say this, but I think what you described was a level of laziness because we'll chase the news release. We'll chase the Twitter feed as opposed to turning that lens around and saying to Canadians, what is it that you really are or having a sense or listening to what they really want to be talking about and then pursuing it. I don't mean in an advocacy way. I mean more of in an accountability way or more of a way of reflecting what this country's all about. Yeah, and, and you know, I'll be fair to all the political journalists. It, 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 maybe it's laziness, but I, I think a lot of it, too, is just the requirements of feeding the beast. You know, there are – everybody has a job, and reporters are no different to anybody else. And, and their, their publications, their business models incentivize that type of hamster wheel coverage where every day got to say something new. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of at The Logic is that we give our reporters the time and space and hopefully the resources they need to take a longer view. And we don't require people to file every day. They're filing once every two weeks uh, at this stage. And it's something that's more thoughtful than that about things like, you know, how is the country, if you position us in a foreign affairs landscape, when you have a global arms race with the US, China and the UK and some matters, where does Canada fit in? And so you can see how uh, an issue as acute as Afghanistan right now, how does that play into the larger uh, polarization of the world and Canada's role in it uh, relative to the United States, relative to China, relative to Iran and, 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 and the UK and others? And, and so, um, you know, we try to zoom out a little bit, I guess, is, is the, short, uh, the short way of saying that. Well, one of the things that you, you, you know, have sort of launched your whole publication around and the brand around was this whole idea of the, the innovation economy. And, you know, I don't know, you, I, maybe you did, but I'm, I'm guessing you didn't see the pandemic coming. So, um, yeah. but at this stage, if nothing else highlighted what you guys have been talking about has been the pandemic and that we are maybe even accelerating that move into what will have to be uh, an innovation economy. Do, do you guys get a sense that we're, we're on the right track there or, or we have the capacity to get there? Well, you know, on a personal note, I would say I, I believe in this country. I'm an immigrant to this country. This country has afforded me every opportunity. I've been blessed with a, a solid education system, public education system, uh, health care, everything else. And, and so, you know, I believe in this country fundamentally. I think the word innovation is an interesting one, and it was one that perhaps we may have deliberately chosen at the logic because of its vagueness. It is a broad word and a term that can kind of be used or interpreted however you want to see innovation. There's innovation in, as we were talking about before I came on air, there's innovation in radio. There's innovation uh, in banking. There's innovation in geopolitical realm. There's innovation in climate and, and energy transformation. So innovation is really just... Uh, the continuing evolution of a country and optimizing and striving to be better. So in the case of Canada, I think the there are a few key issues right now. One of them is the energy transformation. Uh, this is a country that has fundamentally relied economically on, on its energy resources and more recently on housing. Um, real estate drives most of this economy. There was a statistic from Bloomberg that I I, I pulled out for my column that that showed that um, Canada's real output per GDP has grown by 0.2% annually since 2005, and that non-housing related investment makes up just 7% of Canada's economy. That's a problem when you're competing against China and the United States, the UK and others for intellectual property, research and development, um, striving to be better. We talk about having 10 Shopify's in this country. That was Navdeep Bain's big campaign push uh, in 2015. Um, what does that look like? What does that mean? What does that mean for Alberta? Uh, what does that mean in Quebec, which has taken a large uh, push towards hydro and, and, and uh, uh, renewable, uh, renewable energy sources? These are all big questions, and I'm, and I'm kind of sweeping 
it all across the sky here to say that I think when you think about innovation, and as we at The Logic think about innovation, what we're really talking about is just the future of the country. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's, that's fair, but it, it, it sort of frames it in this, um, the need to be creative, the need to access imagination, the, you know, I mean, to, to use an overworked phrase, to think outside the box. Yeah. And, um, you know, the idea that even when you talk about how the economy is based and so much of it based on real estate, I don't think a lot, and again, even those of us who think we're paying attention, we're not aware of this. <laughs> there's there's not enough conversation yeah. going on around this so that, in fact, we could be failing right in front of our eyes and not see it. Yeah, and, and it's important to note that these aren't partisan issues or they shouldn't be partisan issues. Uh, this, these are the facts. And so how each party interprets that and communicates their vision for how to deal with that, that's important. And that should be articulated during the campaign. Um, but the fact that it's happening, I think what, what's been so perhaps disheartening over the last maybe decade of politics is, and maybe that's fed from social media and other things, but that the discourse has been now, well, we don't even accept the baseline facts. Uh, we can't agree on those as parties. Mm-hmm. And so I think part of our challenge as media in the campaign is to actually set the baseline of these are the facts by asking all the politicians those questions and, and trying to at least accept that that's the baseline of where we are. Um, you know, and, and, you know, they're, they're, each party has a different approach to it, and that's that's for the electorate to decide how, how to, you know, which which path is the right one. I, I want to get to those accountability questions in a second here, but before we do, and and I realize this is kind of out of your lane in terms of what the logic specifically um, covers, but just knowing you as a you know journalist, producer, editor, so on, when we talked about the issues earlier the ones that were top of mind for Canadians. Two and a half months ago, this country was on fire emotionally over what had gone on with the residential schools. I talked to John Wright at Maru Public Opinion this week, and that issue is way down the list. <laughs> yeah. So who, where does that fall? You know, let's put your editor hat on here for me. Where does that well, fall in terms of making the daily assignments around, say, a campaign? To say, okay, it was important and, you know, people were screaming and yelling and crying and shaking visibly and emotionally by what had gone on. Here we are in the middle of a campaign and it's there, there's not even on the radar, David. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, I was also just thinking during the Olympic Games, um, there was a lot of Canadian flag waving. And I, I was struck by that juxtaposition of the flag waving, waving during the Olympics and a month prior during Canada Day. And, and how, how different it felt. It was as if they were completely different uh, conversations entirely. I wonder, Dave, if, that's, if that permeates through, not necessarily as a campaign issue, but as, a, as an identification issue uh, in how we carry ourselves and how in, in the leaders we choose to represent us on the world stage. And... I, you know, it's kind of when you're making a hiring decision, a soft skill versus a hard skill. I wonder if this falls more into the soft skill category where it's, well, you know, is this going to be this party? Is this party going to be a great representative of us and who we want to be and who we aspire to be in addressing these very difficult issues as opposed to here's my platform that I'm putting forth as a hard skill, as a tactic uh, to address it? Again, that's just my own quick hypothesis mm-hmm. thinking about it well i mean i think it actually falls in nicely with with the column that you wrote in terms of this is really a reflection of us so we might have been all upset and and bangry about a particular issue at one point but because let's say social media at short attention spans it just falls off the desk and in the moment we're voting on something that's right in front of us so you know, what does that say uh, just about our our own sense of our history our own sense of um, you know, accountability in, in, in this country. So on that, now you will know that I was talking to Keith Leslie, former um, Queens Park Bureau Chief for the Canadian Press earlier, and, you know, saying that you don't get the story at Queens Park or any city hall or anything else by sitting in the committee meeting or sitting in the legislature listening to the debate. 
you get the story because you followed somebody down the hall and caught them outside their office, or you saw them in the barbershop or wherever it happens to be, but that you make this personal one-on-one connection with somebody and you're able to get the story out of conversation, relationship, whatever it may be. COVID has restricted that significantly. We have all of these Zoom call news conferences. You have your one phone question, one follow up, and then you're off the line. And so it's a completely different dynamic. And that, I think, has restricted some of the ability for journalists to generally to ask these accountability questions. You amplify that on the campaign where it is so tightly controlled. You know, you and I might be on the bus for the liberals and we've end up in Saskatoon. Well, we know that the Saskatoon local media gets the first three questions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then you and I have to decide which question the rest of the gallery who's on the plane gets to ask. It's so restricted. And, you know, it's great for you and I to be talking about our role as journalists to say we are going to hold them accountable. The environment doesn't really allow us to do that very well these days. Yeah, you know, and and our bread and butter is... is covering technology companies and I would say that um, even pre-pandemic technology companies uh, would never give access to us it was not something you know I, I shouldn't totally generalize but when we were writing stories about large big tech companies um, it was very difficult to get them to uh, sit down with us and so I think that experience has kind of given us the the calluses as well as the muscles to to not cover campaigns with a dependency on the candidates themselves. We have their platforms. We can read what they say. It's about surfacing the issues that will be significant. So, you know, we have in Ottawa, we have two reporters, um, uh, uh, former CP bureau chief, David Reevely and, and Murad Umadi, who's uh, outstanding on tech policy. They understand the issues. And I think that if you have reporters who understand the issues and have built beats around the issues, so in the case of David, it's infrastructure. Uh, in the case of Murad, it's tech policy. Then you actually don't need the politicians. <laughs> you know, you can you can reach out to them. You won't expect anything from them. But it's really about highlighting what the concerns are, and then if the politicians choose to respond to that or not, that's entirely on them. I should also add, you know, we had a conversation. I had a conversation with our senior editors about being on the bus this year and for the cost, the cost benefit analysis of it, it's not cheap for, for those that wouldn't know you have to pay to be on those uh, campaigns. And uh, it's not a cheap exercise. And as you said, Dave, you know, what does it give you? Um, the first question, maybe uh, once in a, once a week uh, on an issue. So we chose that we, we don't actually, we aren't on the buses this year. Uh, and I think that we're not really going to feel that, we're not, it's not going to be that different for us. If anything, our hope is that if we hit week three, week two, week three of the campaign and uh, the momentum of the issues of the day starts to slow down a little bit, that perhaps some of the reporting that we're continuing to do on issues of interest to the governments, uh, government or, or future governments, um, that it'll force them to respond to some of our work. That, that will be our metric of success is uh, did we surface an issue in the campaign that became an issue that had to be talked about and move the needle on uh, on the policy side of it uh, for when the campaign is over. Because really, for us, this isn't about who wins the election. It's about what happens when we have a government again. Yeah. And, and I think to your point, you're not talking about a gotcha issue. You're talking about one of those, you know, whether it's the kitchen table issue or whatever you want to call it, but something that does affect the way we live uh, and and work in this country. You know, it's, a, it's astounding to me just in a small way when we, because uh, keeping with the foreign affairs theme, during the first week of the campaign, there has not been a single question, as far as I can tell, asked about Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. Um, you know, like this, and what does that say? It's, it's not necessarily about, as I've written in other columns, that those two men continuing to be detained in China says a lot about, our ability to influence foreign policy and economic, uh, the, the world economic landscape, um, as much as, you know, uh, on a personal note, their, their livelihood and their families. So that it hasn't come up in the first week, I find incredibly perplexing uh, and, and, and disheartening um, because it is uh, more than that. And one other thing I'll say, uh, you know, you mentioned John Wright and the polling about 
uh, indigenous reconciliation not being something that's top of mind, perhaps, you know, I, I tend to think that these issues all are connected, that there isn't, yes, we can look at them as, yeah, my top issue is climate change. My second issue is housing affordability. My third issue is indigenous reconciliation. But at the end of the day, I care about all of it. And um, forcing, with great respect to John, but but having pollsters force these questions to be binary in a way, uh, I think I think frames it as if you know people only have one or two issues that they care about. I, I think it's I think it's all of it. I think it's all connected, and and kind of comes back to what I was saying before, which is you know about what kind of country we want to be. Yeah, and I think to, to perhaps I didn't frame it properly. John was looking at it. What is is any one of these issues going to drive you to the to the polls or affect your vote? So right. that was sort of the, the the context of it. But I agree. I mean, to your point, they're all in the pie, right? We've just cut the pie up differently. But I, I'm we should I guess be encouraged that it that is still uh, part of the the conversation. David Scott, thank you for joining us. David is the CEO and Editor-in-Chief at uh, The Logic, and uh, I would encourage you to go and visit the site, thelogic.co. Good to talk to you, David. Always great chatting, David, and uh, good luck during the campaign. Thank you, sir. We're uh, having fun with this. (laughs) All right, that'll do it for us on this uh, weekend edition of The Rit Race. And if you uh, like what you hear... We would encourage you to subscribe, share, leave us a comment. Uh, Otherwise, you can uh, follow me on Twitter, at Dave Trafford, uh, on Instagram, at Dave Trafford. And you can also find me on Facebook. So it's pretty easy uh, to get. And we'd love to have the comments. Let us know what you think. And uh, we'd be happy to entertain them and acknowledge the uh, comments, the feedback that we get on The Rit Race. I'm Dave Trafford. This is an Eye Contact Podcast.